One thing that I kind of spend some time thinking on here within this discussion of the importance of attenuating uh, muscle strength and size loss as we age, avoiding sarcopenia so we can stay vigorous and and functional. Um, And we're trying to, I guess, also achieve, you know, a reduction in risk of, say, cardiometabolic disease. And so sometimes when I see the high protein message, I think, okay, if people go out and do that, does it depend on the source of that protein as to whether they're shifting their cardiometabolic health in the right direction, right? Because, of course, part of improving health span, in addition to uh, avoiding sarcopenia, is not having a heart attack, not having a stroke, etc. And at least the majority of the research that I've seen looking at you know, converging lines of evidence suggests that swapping say red meat or white meat for fatty fish or sources of plant protein and shifting to that more Mediterranean or like the Danish dietary guidelines is probably beneficial from a cardiometabolic perspective. Do you do you have any thoughts on that? I guess when people with regards to where people are getting their protein from, if they're optimizing it to get to 1.6 grams per kilogram, given that the I guess the differences in those pro in the protein once you're at an optimal level don't seem to make a huge difference for strength and hypertrophy. What do you think about so overall protein selection from a health span point of view? I agree with that. <laughs> I mean, what you outlined is what the bulk of the evidence shows. Uh, you know, there there are entire huge communities who all they eat is is red meat some of them just eat, literally eat red meat and salt <laughs> um i think that maintaining a certain level of physical activity and leanness can act as a shield against the potential adverse cardiovascular effects of such a diet but i you know if you were to look at the evidence and see where the risks lie and how we might optimize it. Um, it really does it really does not encourage a predominantly red meat protein selection of the diet. Um, the evidence does seem to, in quotes, allow a certain amount of red meat like in the course of a day or the course of a week, like roughly, what, 70 grams uh, weight-wise, not protein grams, <laughs> 70 gram weight, like so two and a half ounces or something a day as sort of what the health agencies converge upon being, okay, well, that that's okay. You know, you're not, you're not putting yourself at significantly higher risk than, than people who than people who avoid it. But even even then, you can point to research showing that the risk is still lower when you avoid it. I would tend to default to that guideline for red meat limits being the roughly, if you're going to have it, limit it to a total of, um, you know, 500 ish, whatever grams weight wise, or over a week. week, That's right. Um, Which in imperial terms is what, like roughly 16 ish ounces, 16, 17 ounces over the course of the week, I think that's a, a reasonable, a reasonable limit. Um, I think that there's a lot of data accumulated now showing that uh, plant-based, plant-based proteins actually have have a, a healthier cardiovascular risk effect, or, or rather, association profile. Than the animal-based proteins, and and you know we can love our animal proteins, but we have to face the <laughs> we have to face the evidence, right? Yeah, and and so, as you say, it's not necessarily an all or nothing play for for sure. people. Mm-hmm. I guess I just look at where is the current protein intake at, and mm-hmm. I think you said before it might only be around one gram per kilogram, right around there. So, mm-hmm. so if we want people to get up to one point six grams per mm-hmm. kilogram, they have to increase their protein. You know, quite substantially, and I think at least based on Chris Gardner's r- research and what he's published, about 
70 to 85 percent of current protein intake is from animal protein so it seems to me that there is i guess room there for the addition of these more uh, plant-based sources of protein and we could probably throw fatty fish in there as well because the outcome data for that seems to be pretty similar uh to help to help get to that kind of optimal total protein intake as I, opposed I to just throwing on a lot more red meat and white meat i agree and, and i think that um you know, even the omnivore members of your audience um, would stand to, uh, they would benefit from having a, a broader rotation of, of protein types uh, within their diet. So not just constantly pounding the, the red meat and the skin on chicken. Um, I think that uh, protein powders are an underrated underrated tool in, in the health toolbox. I, I had a bunch of uh, arguments with folks saying the protein powder is not real food. And, eh, come on, man, that's, I mean, that that's absurd. Yeah, I think you have to come back to the evidence and does nutrient, compound food, how does it affect how health outcomes? Because before when you were talking about those studies looking at isolated, uh, amino acids and some of these different responses in muscle protein synthesis it was immediately popping into my head was well we're going to see a future of new functional foods available that could be really helpful for say elderly populations that that have reduced appetite aren't eating as much food maybe have dental problems and these could be you know very beneficial from a sarcopenia point of view for sure it, it just gets difficult to consume an in quotes optimal amount of protein in some of these subsets of the elderly population who have dysphagia, sarcopenic dysphagia, problems chewing and swallowing, and that sort of thing. And so these types of tools, whether it be protein powders or even amino acid supplementation, those, those things can be potentially a, a, a boon for kind of providing solutions to these problems that, that we know are not going to go away. Mm -hmm.